It was a simple idea, putting young people together with Nobel Peace Prize winners. On this spot in the spring of 1994, I saw four young Latino males carrying guns. These guys were my neighbors. These guys lived across the street from me for years. I said, hey guys, come over here. I want to talk to you for a second. They came over and said, what's up? I said, what are you doing with a the gun? They said, well, we have a business. I said, well, what do you need the gun for? They said, to protect our turf. And I said, to have a business, you got to be pretty smart. And I haven't seen you guys go to school in three years. So I asked them a question. Who's the president of the United States? They said, we don't know and we don't care because the president of the United States doesn't represent our interests. We tripped over the topic of South Africa and these young men went off. They went, oh yeah, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's this little guy and he stood up in front of the guns of apartheid. He's so bad, he went to jail. They did everything and he never carried a gun. And I said, why don't you be a little bit more like Desmond Tutu and not carry a gun? So I had this idea to put young people together with Nobel Peace Prize winners in an education program that was based in service learning that I didn't know where to start. I had no one to turn to until I remembered this woman. And so I started talking to her about it every day, driving her crazy, saying, Nobel Peace Laureates and Youth, kids and Nobel Peace Prize winners, kids and Nobel Peace Prize winners, kids and He would Nobel not Peace Prize stop. Winners. I probably talking drove her and crazy. And talking. You did. And he just was so excited about the idea that finally I said, well, you know what? Yeah, I'll help. We put the plan together. We contacted the chief of staff for the Dalai Lama, and he said yes. Yes, come to India, meet the Dalai Lama, and present him with your idea. So I had a dollar seventy-nine in my bank account at the time, being a poor person, and I was going around to my friends saying, "Hey, could you let me ten twenty dollars so I could buy a round trip ticket to India because I have a meeting with the Dalai Lama." And they. <laughs> No one believed they laughed it. in my face. <laughs> Everybody laughed. No one believed we had this meeting, but somehow we were able to convince enough people to lend us the money so that we could fly to India, meet with the Dalai Lama. He loved the idea, and he said, yes, I will do this. And he wanted us also to contact other Nobel Peace Prize winners who are friends of his so young people could study these other Nobel Peace Prize winners to get a different perspective on the world. So we ended up back here in Denver, Colorado, cold calling Nobel Peace Prize winners. Calling long distance information in Cape Town, South Africa. Can you hook me up with Archbishop Desmond Tutu? And they said, <laughs> man, you're crazy. If somebody as flawed and average as us can get a program up and running like this, imagine what you can do. So to put it simply, it's Nobel Peace Prize winners mentoring youth to change the world. And 17 years later, we now have over one million young people who participated in the Peace Jam program from 39 countries around the world, creating a whole new generation of young social innovators. Um, and these young social innovators, they have created two million global call to action projects to fix the problems that they're facing in their own community. And we now have 13 Nobel Peace Prize winners who joined our board. And we've been nominated, both of us have been nominated seven times for the Nobel Peace Prize. I know it's hard to believe, but... <laughs> But seven Nobel Peace Prize winners have nominated us for the Nobel Peace Prize because they believe so strongly in the transformational power of the Peace Jam program. Also, 10 years ago, we were actually married by Desmond Tutu. We were married by Archbishop Desmond Tutu at his church in Cape Town, South Africa. And then, right after the service, all I can say, he dragged us behind the uh, altar to what I'd call a green room, I, I don't know what they call these, but he grabbed me by the ear, grabbed Dawn by the hand, dragged us back into this room, and he said, you listen to me, anybody I marry doesn't get divorced. And he kept going on, and he kept going on, and he kept going on. I said, okay, Father, stop the violence. <laughs> but it was a beautiful thing, thank you. <laughs> and we're here today because we're convinced, we're absolutely, totally convinced that average ordinary people can tackle the toughest issues facing humanity. We're convinced that ordinary folks can change the course of future 
the course of, of the future for all of humanity, and this is the most important thing, we're totally convinced that we already have the power to do it in our own hands. We already have the power. We have it right here. Okay, so that's our big, bold statement. So I need to hear from all of you now. Who um, would agree with what I just said? Okay. And now, another show of hands. Who would say that we're just completely crazy? I mean, these two Americans are nuts. We're barking mad, right? We get a lot of that. Yeah, we get a lot of that. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. But I want to tell you a story about some young people, stunningly average young people, in a stunningly average suburb of Denver, Colorado. They looked around their school and they said, there's a lot of waste going on. These people, young people, are ecologically conscious. They looked around, they went to the principal of the school, they said, you know what, nobody's turning off the lights in the school. So the principal said, yes, please do that. They looked around some more and they said, there's too much garbage that we need to recycle. So they began recycling that. Then they look at the next thing. Um, where does this energy that we use come from? And they looked at it and said, that must be a pretty big bill. So they went out, raised money, and bought a wind turbine for their school. In the first year, they saved $50,000. After five years, that's a quarter million US dollars. And for those of you who are businessmen, you can see where peace and ecological issues does affect your business. I want to tell you the story about some young people from New Mexico, a state where only half of young people ever graduate from high school. The liter literacy rate is the second lowest in the country, and they put together a program to teach young people how to read. This was 12, 13, 14-year-olds teaching kids who were six, seven, eight years old how to read. Um, their program was so successful that the summer camp, the intensive summer camp they created, it raised the grade level, the reading level, for all of these young people by at least one grade, if not two, in only two weeks. So powerful that it's now being replicated across the state. But they didn't stop there. They also wanted to help their classmates whose fathers and, and mothers were in prison. So they took books into prison. And they had the fathers and mothers who were incarcerated read these books. They tape recorded it. And then they brought home these children's books and the tape recordings to the children. And so they have something to hold on to. They have their pa father or their mother um, reading them a story, putting them to bed every night, and teaching them to read, to breaking the cycle of poverty and incarceration. And these were young people from New Mexico. As you know, one of the biggest problems that is facing us on the planet Earth is a lack of water, lack of potable water. We have a Peace Jam team, we call them Team uh, Tibet, in Dharamsala, India, and uh, they had an audience with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama said, we have been, the we have been on the receiving end of people helping us for years. It's about time we gave back. So the young Tibetans, knowing that there is looking down from the palace and deep, deep down, there was an encampment of about 500 people that had no running water. So the young people said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to dig hole to get all the way over there, and we're going to up, set up some spigots to run water. So they dug. They dug three feet down, as prescribed by India law. They dug three feet down, down this hill. They ran the pipe to up to the asphalt road. Then they dug into the asphalt road and kept, kept digging another, I don't know, 100 meters or something to put uh, these three spigots of water in. They said the hardest part of this job was getting past the bu bureaucracy of the Indian officials there. But here, they helped people. They did it. They gave them potable water. And this is in a community of, of approximately 500 people. And there are other people coming out. And I'm truly, truly amazed by these young Tibetans. And this is a global project. And here are Tibetans giving back. And because of all the things that we've seen young people do, we've worked with over a million young people, we are absolutely convinced that average, ordinary people can truly create tremendous change. I mean, we are so on fire. 
about this big idea, that we actually spoke about it at the Social Innovation Summit in Silicon Valley last December. And as soon as we finished our speech, we got off stage, and somebody from Google came up to us, and he told us that he was going to kidnap us. Now, I found that rather unusual to be at the Social Innovation Summit, to be kidnapped by this gentleman named Meng from Google, and he said, you don't want to eat the food here at the Social Innovation Summit. You want to come to Google. We have much better food. So after we spent the lunchtime discussing our approaches to peace, and Meng's, one of Meng's goal is to create world peace in his day. We are here to work with young people to teach them to have the Nobels teach them the ropes. So, yeah, it's truly in Meng's job description on his, his business card. Um, he wants to create the conditions for world peace in his lifetime. Uh, if he was one of the original employees of Google, they get a lot of leeway, I guess. Um, uh, for us, you know we're all about people power and changing the world. So we decided to put his big idea together with our big idea, and we knew if we did this, we'd come up with something extraordinary. And so that's exactly what we're doing. Um, since December, we've been planning and planning and planning, and we actually spoke at the United Nations um, in May, just two months ago, to announce our intention. That's Meng from Google, Yvonne and me, um, speaking at the United Nations, saying that we're going to create a new one billion acts of peace campaign. Now look at it. I'm an average flawed human being, and I want you to check out what I'm wearing. That was from thrift shop. That was 80s clothes, the most hideous clothes I could find. <laughs> I was sitting in Ban Ki-moon's chair, his throne. <laughs> And I'm not going to tell you whether or not I sullied the chair with some emission of gas. <laughs> <laughs> and so, ever since, ever since we spoke at the United Nations, we have gathered a group of really brainy Googlers who are creating a cutting-edge campaign designed to inspire one billion high-quality projects, projects addressing the root causes of all the worst problems facing humanity. And we want to have one billion projects completed by the end of the year 2018. Um, our Nobel laureates have already shown the way. Our Nobel laureates, the 13 of them, have told us the 10 key areas where they want these projects to happen. If we really want to change a future for all of humanity, we need to address the root causes of problems like extreme poverty and ensuring rights for women and children, and access to clean water for everyone. We're not going to wait for our governments, and we're not going to wait for our elected officials. We're just going to get together, and we're just going to do it. And we've got a lot of big partners who are coming in. The Huffington Post just joined as our lead media sponsor. And this whole campaign will be launched in May. We'll be back at the United Nations in May of 2014. And once again, we're just average people. There's nothing special about us. And I'll get to tell you a story. My parents, before I went to high school, gave me that talk about not taking drugs, which I consequently forgot two seconds after the gave it to me. <laughs> Had some problems with it over the year, but <laughs> they said anything could become normal. Shooting heroin, selling your sister for crack cocaine, being a young person in your own school, taking a gun and killing people, which happened in Colorado. This has become normal? Now, that's not normal to me, and I'm not, look at me, like I would know what normal is. <laughs> but, you know, uh, this is what my parents said, anything had become normal. What we are asking you to do is to join us in this time to create a new normal. Let's do something that, for the world we want to live in, instead of the world we have fallen into and allow ourselves to keep slipping down that slope. All right. So I need to ask you one more time. How many of you think that our big idea, our big vision is possible? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you think 
at least it's worth a try. I mean, you know, what have we got to lose? Come on. Yeah, all right. Everyone's raising their hand. Thank you. So this is your formal invitation, right here, right this second. Anybody who's watching this speech, you're formally, officially invited to join our One Billion Acts of Peace campaign. It doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're young or old or someplace in between. And we promise you that this is going to be the coolest, most fun, and most effective campaign that the world has ever seen. Inspiration can, can be found anywhere if you look. There's some people find inspiration in prayer, inspiration in taking a walk. Me personally, I found my inspiration in a Detroit rock and roll band called the MC5, the Motor City Five. Does anybody know who the Motor City MC5 <laughs> is? Kick out the jams. Well, they had a saying and I stuck to it. I was listening. As 11, 12-year-old boy, I listened to it. Are you going to be part of the problem, or are you going to be part of the solution? Which is it? Do you want to sit on your butts and let everything pass you by, or do you want to be part of the solution and make this place a better world? And so that's what we're asking you today. Become part of the solution. Join us. Thank you so much for listening to what we've had to say, and that's all we've got. <laughs>